Good morning, good morning, good morning. I just had a moment of reflection. And it was kind of wild. Ownership is going out of style. I'm serious. People do not want to own anything. And um, it kind of reared this ugly head when I talked about that I paid cash for two cars. And people were like, that's crazy. You should lease or you should have bought crypto. And one of the things <clears throat> that we as a society are moving away from ownership we want to have control uber <clears throat> is the largest taxi company in the world followed by lyft but uber and lyft don't own any cars airbnb <clears throat> largest hotel in the world airbnb doesn't own any property. See, the thing is, you get to make money from things you don't own. And the it has filtered down to common people. Airbnb, Lyft, Facebook <clears throat> doesn't own any of his content but makes billions and people are now getting hip I've seen this on Toro where people want to do long term leases for their cars never actually owning them having a built in exit strategy that when they're done with them they just give them back and I wonder where this all comes from because I understand Uber, I understand Lyft, I understand Airbnb. They're making all of this money from having access to an asset without the vast upfront cost into the asset they're making billions of dollars from other people's property and I don't understand well I don't know if this is good or bad because at the end of the day when you don't have ownership you don't have absolute control this is a problem that Uber and Lyft are currently going through because they don't have ownership and they were leveraging the assets of other people a lot of people said we don't want to drive for Uber right now so Uber and Lyft are struggling to get drivers because they don't have the control of the asset if Uber and Lyft own the cars and it's like look if you want to make this money you got to drive for us they wouldn't be having the problem that they're having now and I don't really know a lot about the Airbnb space. Uh, I'm not really on it or aware of it. So I can't speak about it. But with control comes sacrifices. And right now, the average person likes options. Options trading is a form of control and manipulation and profit profiting without actually owning the stock so in a in a word everyone is kind of trying to rent seek by having financial control of an asset without the upfront cost of buying the asset like i've invested two hundred and forty thousand dollars in buying cars and another twenty five thousand dollars in a secured business credit card for my car rental business. I'm 
conducting a lot of experiments and I am constantly bombarded by people who are looking for these tactics of how can I get the money without owning it, without coming up with the upfront cost? How can I, because essentially I was sitting there like, why are so many people hitting me up with this? And it just hit me in the moment of reflection. The Ubers, the Lyfts, the Airbnbs, the Facebooks, all of these companies are profiting from assets that they don't own. And I mean, it, it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it, but Mark Zuckerberg, I believe, is in the top 10 of the wealthiest people in the world. So people are seeing all of this money being generated from not owning stuff, but controlling stuff. And people are trying to figure out how can I get into the controlling seat without owning the asset? Because I have a theory and I have a theory that this is going to backfire. Let's use the issue that Lyft and Uber have right now. Because they don't own the asset, they cannot dictate how that asset will be used because the drivers own the asset and the drivers are saying, we don't want to work for you. But if Uber and Lyft own the asset, because I, I have a feeling at some point this is going to create a problem for the Ubers, the Lyfts, the Airbnb. Well, it's already a problem for Uber and Lyft right now. I feel that it's going to be a problem for Airbnb and other entities that don't own assets that they make money off of. Because here's the thing. I am a big believer in ownership. Because ownership gives you absolute control. Now, when you are manipulating ownership, when you're when you're doing an Uber or Airbnb, at any moment, your people can revolt and then take that asset away from you, and then you're in a situation where you cannot utilize that asset to make money. So I see in the future this is going to be problematic for these entities that are making billions. They're making billions from assets that they don't own. And now that I have a greater understanding of where you guys are coming from because I'm from the old school ownership. You own stuff. You you you. But with with ownership comes responsibility. And this is one of the things that the Ubers, the Lyfts, the Airbnbs have been able to get away from. They get to make money from these assets without the responsibility of ownership. And it's a cost because when you look at I haven't done the research, so I can't speak on it because I really want to know who makes most money. Does Hilton, which owns his properties, Hilton, uh, Holiday Inn, or Airbnb? I'm, I don't really have those numbers at the moment. And um, I wonder, is there more money in ownership? Because when you look at, like... Hertz, uh, National, uh, Avis, they own their cars and they rent them out. And you know, it, it's a very interesting thing because I understand that you guys are deeply influenced by what you see before your eyes. I mean, you see this every day. You see this every day. And I don't really know because I'm going to continue to be 
a owner. I'm going to continue to own things. I, you know, that's just who I am. But as we go forward in the future, like, I will say that if I leased 20 cars for my my rental car business, I immediately get a huge tax write-off. Each one of those leases, because it's a business purpose vehicle, is 100% deductible. So that would be a smart move to lease a car for the car rental business. However, the devil is in the details. Just because you can lease a car doesn't mean that that car is going to be the right car for your car rental business, which I have discovered. So from a business standpoint, from a tax standpoint, it makes sense, it makes money. But from a, you know, you, you got to lease the right cars. That's the trick. That's the tricky part. So, but that right there Will, is a winning strategy and will work if you are in, if you're in a hot market and that's something else I've discovered if you're in a really hot market it doesn't matter what kind of car you have they will they will get these cars but buying a car and financing a car where you do not um, get these automatic tax benefits gets a little bit dicey. You know, because there, there's a way to do it, but it's a little bit more complicated because you would have to have an LLC, which I fully endorse. You have to have an LLC. You will also have to um, set things up a certain kind of way. But here is the, the thing. And here's the problem. Can you do an Uber? and Lyft or Airbnb move on the personal level. Can you go out and convince people to allow you to use their assets and make money? Because I find that on a smaller macro level, that's very, very challenging. That's very, very challenging. Like if you went up and asked all your friends like, hey, can I use your car to rent out on such and such? You know, we, we split the difference. I'll give you 80% of the money and I'll keep 20%. And if you can convince like 50 of your friends to do that, you can make a lot of money with no money invested. But it's going to be kind of hard to convince 50 of your friends to allow you to use their cars for a car rental business, <laughs> especially if they've been watching my, my videos. It's going to be real, real hard to do that. So that's where I think that we're going to run into some problems with this lack of ownership. A lack of ownership on a large corporate level works beautifully. It works amazingly well. But to try to do the same thing on a smaller personal level gets to be challenging. It gets to be hard. And without ownership, because essentially, let me give you, you know, let, let's say I rented cars for my car rental business. Let's say I leased, I leased, yeah, rented, rented cars for my car rental business. That's what leasing is. You're essentially a long-term rental. And I would immediately get a significant tax benefit and as long as my monthly rental car payment is made, I can do whatever I wanted to do with the money because the goal isn't to pay off the car because I I will never own the car. I will never own the car. So there is no hurry to pay off the lease terms quickly because I'm never going to own it. And at the end of the lease, I turn that car back in. And then I could make all kinds of money, but the cost of the opportunity cost, because let's say I lease 25 cars and let's say that business made me $40,000 a month minus, let's say the average cost of the lease was 450. dollars 
50. So that's nine, it's 9,000, about $12,000 in lease payments. So we will subtract the lease payments and since they're leased, I have to carry full term insurance. So 25 times 130, that's going to be, let's just say $15,000 in overhead between car payments and insurance and other little things, say 15,000. So I would net 25,000 or 300,000 a year. Now, that sounds really good. That's a workable business model. Now, let's go ahead and revisit that in, let's say, 25 cars, and I paid cash for them. And I didn't have any car payments, and I made the same money. Then we're looking at the cost of getting your money back. So we're doing 40,000. Let's say I spent... Um, 300,000 these 25 cars to get to 40,000 and it would take me seven seven and a half months for me to get my money back okay then the rest of the year which would be um, my profit rest of the year would be seven and a half so that would be four and a half months so four times 40 is 160 180 thousand dollars profit so I would make 180 thousand dollars profit the first year and then the second year I would make Second year, forty thousand dollars a month, four hundred and eighty thousand. So four hundred and eighty plus two six eighty. The first two years, the first three years, I would make one point two million. So over the long term, I would make more money with ownership than if I leased because those lease payments will be fixed for the term. So essentially what will happen is my income will adjust and it will slide up. Whereas with leasing, my income will remain the same. So over the long term, you make more money with ownership but in the short term, you make more money with leasing. That's a very interesting argument right there because like I said, I'm gonna continue on the ownership track. I'm going to continue to own and from that position because for me, from a mental standpoint, it's just easier and it's way less stressful because I would be freaking out if I had to pay 25 car payments. That that would be, like say you forget one, next thing you know your credit's bad. Um, one late payment can knock down a good credit score, 50, 70 points, one late payment. So I would um, be freaking out about that. But it's an interesting thing because we as society are gravitating toward the easiest thing. And like this thing with use turn credit into cash, leveraging, never owning anything, never qualifying, never coming up or putting yourself in the position to be an owner and not also not having that responsibility. That is um, another thing that I feel that people are seriously, seriously embracing because here's the thing. And I had someone who was having this argument with me because essentially, you know, 
uh, talking about investing where the average person cannot start a business but the average person can invest the reality is there's not a lot of people making a lot of money with businesses and there's there's not a lot of people making a lot of money with investments that's the reality that's the truth of the matter because when you start talking about climbing into that seven figure territory most of the country falls short whether it's on the investment side whether it's on the um, business building side and also with ownership comes long term benefits that you don't get with leasing let's say you rent an apartment you rent an apartment, you lease an apartment you're in and you're out, you don't own it you don't have the upkeep, you don't have the responsibilities, you can just roll out without a care in the world because you don't own it. But let's say that you went ahead and bit the ownership bug and you, you got this apartment and you own it and over time it appreciates and then at a certain point you could sell it for more money than you paid for it. So it short term, not owning, leasing, manipulating that works. It works. But you don't make as much money if you don't have a long-term holding position. Because um, just with the car rental business, you can lease cars and you can make money. You can make money. You just will not make as much money as if you own those cars. Because with the ownership model, there's a lot more that you can do. There's more flexibility. There is um, more things that you can jump on. There are more things that you can do. There are more things that are on the table for you as an owner. You can make money on the way up. You can make money on the way down. But when you lease or you don't have ownership, you can be screwed at some point because you don't have absolute control. So it's an interesting social experiment that we're undergoing right now because people are moving towards that arena of not owning but using assets to get money from the asset without owning the asset. That's where everyone is running. Everyone's trying to run in this little chute to get it because um, I personally, aside from business credit, will not use credit for my car business. You know, like I said, I got one car that I financed that I, that's running an experiment, and the experiment isn't going that well. Um, if it doesn't pick up, I actually see myself getting rid of that car. And I know because I bought it at Ke Kelly Blue Book value, so I should be able to get rid of that car and not take a big hit because um, the experiment's gonna go on the rest of this month. The experiment's gonna go on um, August and September. And at the end of September, if things are not going the way that I want, I'm getting rid of that car. Because I bought that car to make money and I'm financing it and the experiment isn't going well. It is not going well at all. Um, I haven't made my first payment yet and that car I think the car has made 600 bucks so I'm on track to make my car payment which ain't the goal and if I was leasing that car my car payment would be roughly the same and we would be in the same boat. So th this is why I'm saying that if you're going to lease cars, you have to lease the right car because if you lease the wrong car, you will have yourself a pickle. 
So I'm in a pickle with one car, which I can easily manage to get get in get out of that. But if let's say I had 25 cars and let's say 12 of the cars were turds, they only made enough to pay their car payment. Um, that would be ugly. That would be ugly. So, what do you, what say you? Do you want to be part of the society that is not owning anything? Do you want to be an owner? Or do you want to be a manipulator of other people's assets without the cost and the investment of ownership and more importantly, without the responsibility of ownership? I, that's one thing that actually kind of shocked me how much responsibility you have owning a fleet of cars. I'm responsible for the tires. I'm responsible for the oil changes. I'm responsible for the tune-ups. I'm, resp I'm responsible for everything. And that is something that kind of shocked me because essentially I'm becoming acclimated to the responsibility of having a fleet of cars. And you know now it's not as pressing as it was in the beginning, but where, let's say you, do you want to be part of the ownership click or do you want to be part of the finesse click? Because essentially, Airbnb is finessing people. Uber is finessing people. Lyft is finessing people. Facebook is for sure finessing people. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Let's take Netflix. Netflix um, became an owner. Netflix, and this is when Netflix stock exploded. Remember the House of Cards? Netflix produced that. They didn't buy that. They didn't lease that. Netflix started producing a lot of content in-house and their stock took off. That's the ownership. Netflix owns a lot of its own content. And I feel that the lesson that Netflix learned, as long as we are leasing or we're using other people's, we have to pay these licensing fees. And they, they were like, let's start producing our own content. And like the House of Cards was a big hit. Uh, I think Netflix produced Orange is the New Black. I'm not sure. I'm not really sure because I don't watch a lot of television, so I don't know these things. But yeah, do you, you know, I am pro ownership. And with the warts and the responsibility and the headaches and the hassles, I am pro ownership because ownership gives you more options at the end of the day than leasing. Because leasing, you can make money. You can make money but you will make more money when you're an owner. And I feel that from a social standpoint, in the next five years, we're gonna see more people trying to finesse. We're gonna see a lot more people trying to finesse. We're going to see a lot more um, things happen. And we're going to I see society devolving into the ownership class and the finesse class. And the finesse class, because people don't want responsibility, man. This is why, you know, a lot of men don't want to be in a relationship because you're being in a relationship, you're responsible. You're responsible to that one woman. It's like, I'd rather be a free agent. And this is what people are doing with their jobs. This is what people are doing with um, life, romantic partners. I wanna be a free agent. I don't wanna be responsible. I don't wanna be tied down. So a lot of people are going to eschew ownership. They're gonna like, hey, I don't want it. I don't wanna be part of it. Just, I wanna be a free agent. So a lot of people are not going to vote for ownership they're not going to embrace ownership. They're going to embrace finessing. And I see 
that society is going to be like this pyramid. We're going to have this wide, wide bottom of finessers. The base of the pyramid is going to be finessers. People who are trying to get a buck, trying to leverage money, leverage credit. We're going to have a bunch of finessing. And in the middle, we're going to have people who are going to halfway finesse and they're going to have some ownership. And at the top of the pyramid, we're going to have the owners. And we know the top of any pyramid is very small. I see that's where we're heading. I see that's where we're heading. Because essentially with my car rental business, because you know, I was asking myself, like, I would never rent a car long term. I would I wouldn't do it. But there are a number of people who are doing it. Because the other day I was looking at Hire Car, and when I joined Hire Car, that was 17 pages of cars. This morning it was 12. And there's 20 cars per page. So that means like 120 cars plus, because essentially cars come on the platform and when someone reserves the car and someone gets approved, it comes off the platform. So you can't see it. It's not like Airbnb. You know, you can see that car always, you know, they'll let you know. You can see it, but like the car is not available for the days that you want. It will let you know that, but you can still see the car. Hire car, once that car is rented, it comes off the platform. You cannot see it. So there's no telling how many cars are rented in the Atlanta area. It could be 400, it could be 500 for all I know. I have no clue. But I know for a fact, based upon my research, there's about 140 cars that have been rented in the last two months that I've been doing this. 140, that are gone off the platform. And I don't know how many was there before that. So, you know, fun fact. Aaron's rent to own was started in 1955. People have been renting furniture, washers and dryers and stuff since 1955. So that business model ain't going nowhere. Uh, I'm not even worried about it. I see it exploding, especially with this pandemic where so many people now have bad credit. I, I really see this. So let me know your thoughts. Are you going to be part of the ownership class or are you going to be part of the finesse class? Which way are you going to go? What are you going to do? Because ownership has a burden of responsibility. I have, I own 20 cars now and I'm responsible for 20 cars. And at times it can be like a full-time job. So, and that's why I laugh when people are like, oh, ring cars is passive income. It's not passive, not passive at all. But the options, because let, let's say since I now own these cars and the titles are slowly, I mean, like really slowly coming in. I currently have five titles. I had six. I sold a Porsche. I have five titles out of 19 cars because I'm not getting a title for the Mercedes until I pay it off. So I have five titles, so I have 14 more titles floating out there. But let's go ahead and say September, I'm like, I'm sick of this, I'm tired of this, I don't wanna do this. I actually know someone that has their dealer's license. So if I wanted to, I could say, hey, do this for me, I'll kick you a little money, and I could um, get rid of those cars and get the majority of my money back and do something else. And that's one of the benefits of ownership. Actually, with this current market, I can actually sell some of those cars for more than I pay for. Them. So, um, it's interesting. It's interesting. So, you want to be an owner or you want to be a finesser? Uber's a finesser. Airbnb is a big finesser. Um, Lyft's a finesser, Facebook's a finesser, YouTube's a finesser. Yes, YouTube. YouTube doesn't own any of this content. We, the creators, own the content. So YouTube, YouTube's another one. YouTube, I think, is starting to create some of its own content. But yeah, YouTube is probably one of the biggest finessers out there because essentially what their, their breakdown is, uh, 45, 55. So YouTube gets 45% of 
of the revenue and we get 55% of the revenue from content that they don't own. I mean, everyone, I mean, you know, but also let's kind of really deconstruct that. Google owns YouTube. Google owns YouTube. So the ownership principle comes in. YouTube's kind of doing the finesse game and the ownership game at the same time. Hmm, that's really interesting. So let me know your thoughts. I got some new training coming up toward the middle of the month. Some new credit stuff. Be looking out for that. Don't buy anything right now. Let me uh, get that together, and I will see you guys in the next one.